Hey, hey, this is Ross, and welcome to Fruit Talk. This is a podcast-style video that I do every single Wednesday at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk about all kinds of things about fruits and vegetables and food and important announcements with my YouTube channel or interesting things that I've read or interesting comments that people ask me. Um, all kinds of different stuff, all about fruits and all about vegetables. Um, in this video, I want to talk about quite a few things. We're going to talk about figs. We're going to talk about melons. We're going to talk about tomatoes. We're going to talk about apples. We're going to talk about things I have for sale, yada, yada, yada. So let's get into it. Um, the first thing I want to mention, guys, is that I have a lot of things for sale right now. And, you know, uh, if you are interested in buying uh, any kind of fig cuttings this year, they're going to be sold in late November for the most part. I'm going to be start, I'm going to start listing, though, some of my fig cuttings a bit earlier um, on very, a very few varieties, and that's it. But the majority of them will be sold in late November, um, but a few I'm going to be listing for auction next week. I also have some things up here right now, like fig trees. I have a Smith fig tree for sale, believe it or not. I put on four air layers on my tree, and uh, I now have five trees, but I thought, you know what, I'd sell one, see what happens. It really is my best overall fig. I'm trying to make as many copies of it. I'm not going to have actually that many cuttings to sell this year. Uh, because a lot of them I'm going to be rooting myself or I'm going to be trading away to people. Um, so there's really not much left at that point to sell. So if you want a tree or you want cuttings, it's got to happen very soon from this variety. I also have a Dal Oso um, tree as well for sale that's extremely well rooted. The, both of these trees will be full size trees in no time, even though they're in one gallon size pots. We also did a huge pomegranate cutting sale that went by pretty quick. And they're super easy to root. In fact, I have a 100% success rate on pomegranates rooting them. They're easier than figs, believe it or not. And I do the same exact way, the same exact method, all the same principles apply to pomegranates. I even treat them the same way. I grow them in containers. I put them away in the winter time. It's literally like almost the same plant, um, except for, I mean, there's obvious differences there, but the way I handle it. But anyway, so if you want to buy some things from me, you can go on FigBid, and this is exactly where everything will be sold and listed in the future, even in late November when I sell cuttings. FigBid.com. My friend Danny is the one who created this website. He used to work for the NYPD. It is a joy to be listing things on this website, and I think that's why I'm selling so many things this year, is because it's just so easy, and it's so easy to communicate to people. Um, it's easy to you know answer questions, easy to do this, easy to do that. It's easy, easy for the buyer to. Um, so everything will be listed here. I also have for sale, the last thing I want to mention is I have uh, some Rasmataz grape cuttings. It's a muscadine grape that's a continuous fruiter. For those of you guys who are interested in that, you know, send me a private message either on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or you can send me an email. Um, so let's, I want to talk actually about Another thing that's for sale, but not by me, but Just Fruits and Exotics, a nursery that I highly respect in Florida, they sell really large plants, is also selling Smith, is also selling Black Madeira. They just sent me an email to people that are on the wait list, and I'm obviously I'm on the wait list, mainly just for, for interest and curiosity. Um, but Black Madeira is available there. It's quite expensive, man. $110 for a tree, but I think $110 gets you a three gallon size pot, if I'm not mistaken. So well, this one's grafted own roots, but it's in a three gallon size pot. So that's awesome. Um, Smith's also in a, in a um, three gallon size pot as well, as, long, as, many, as well as other fig varieties on here. I highly recommend them. I think Smith, if you include shipping, it's like $120 for a tree for a really sizable tree. So that's really cool. I love this nursery. Um, there really are some of the best out there. So highly recommend that. Um, I also want to talk to you guys about a post I put on Instagram and Facebook because I not only post to YouTube, but I also do things on other forms of social media, also Twitter. It's the same handle as my, uh, my YouTube videos, guys. But basically, this was something I came across recently and I decided to share it. I thought it was really cool. I got this out of the Fedco nursery catalog and certain nurseries will send you um, 
just catalogs. If you have bought from them previously, you can also ask for, for them from some. And some nurseries will just send you some regardless if you want them or not. I mean, somehow you get on people's lists and then they just send you all kinds of crap. Um, so, But the Fedco nursery catalog, it's not the most beautiful one, but it's the most informative that I've come across. And this is, this is easily the most interesting thing I've read in a catalog. And he's got in this uh, catalog is a whole list of the apple varieties that they grow. And it checks off all these check mark uh, check boxes basically and what they can do if they're an apple for cider an apple for fresh eating an apple for pies an apple for this an apple for that and there's only two on this list that actually have all the check marks is to check the check boxes checked which is King David and sweet 16 and King David and actually both of them I have but King David I've heard at least from people in the area it doesn't do well with disease so it may be one that isn't as necessarily as a long lived tree or a tree that um, you know you kind of are going to have to pay more attention to. Sweet 16 is more new, but it is supposed to be a very tasty variety that tastes like cherries. Um, King David also is supposed to be a very tasty apple as well. So pretty cool that some of the more tastiest varieties out there can also do a whole bunch of other things. So I find this thing to be, just be really interesting and I'm I'm happy to be able to share it with you guys. Um, let's see, what else do I want to show you? I'll, I want to go back to figs here. We're going to do tomatoes and melons in just a second. But I want to talk about figs. These are some figs that I've been eating recently um, in this cold weather we've been having. Somehow I've been getting some really high quality stuff. Um, it's been quite dry and I think that's really the key. Um, for most of September and most of October, it's been quite rainy here. Really ruined the quality of my figs. That's usually what happens. I mean, we have a somewhat dry July, somewhat dry August. Mm, August is a bit iffy, but once we get into about September, it's definitely going to start raining quite heavily. But we've had a nice dry period, and I think that's why. I've also use my greenhouse to throw in some smaller plants, um, some younger trees or different things I can easily move. And then that way I can help them ripen those figs. This one here was actually ripened outside. And this one's called Sweet Joy, found by Bass in Bethlehem. And this is a, a uh, I believe it's a Lebanese fig that his father-in-law brought over from the Middle East somewhere. And uh, this damn fig is really good. For a honey fig, I'm quite surprised. Um, it tasted like a marshmallow. I swear to God. Uh, I've had I've had actually some persimmons, some astringent persimmons. You let them soften up like sejo. Tastes exactly like a marshmallow. And I think there's some kind of sugar. Um, just some kind of some some type of sugar in certain fruits that will actually give you that marshmallow flavor. Um, just like some fruits have cotton candy type flavors in them uh, and they've been breeding them to kind of get more of those flavors. I think it's something in the in the sugar or the type of sugar or something with that that uh, in within that variety produces a, a different flavor of sugar. So really, really cool this fig. Um, this here is Noir de Barbentin. We ate this one today. We're going to show you the guys that in a second. Here is his mirror. And his mirror, I, did, I wish I would have got it on film because it's such an incredible variety. It's a 9 out of 10. It tasted just like my Coldenon Blanc. And uh, Coldenon Blanc and Black Madeira are my top two figs for flavor. Um, I definitely can say that this year. People ask me all the time, what are my tastiest? And it's hard to say, but um, I genuinely believe that Coldenon Blanc is my number one. And I think Izmir is right there. It's pretty close with it. Pretty close. Um, but then again, I've only had one fig off of Izmir and it ripened November 1st, whereas my Coldenon Blanc ripened September 1st. So quite a difference there in heat and temperature. But this one was incredible. It was very thick, very jammy. Um, you know, it wasn't as thick as a Coldenon Blanc that I would describe as gooey. It's like eating fig cake. But this was pretty gooey, very thick, um, really great flavor to it. Really wish I would have got it on video. Here's the Black Madeira that I ate, and I've been eating them pretty consistently now. Um, I had one today, I had one yesterday, and I'm going to have one probably tomorrow. 
Um, here's White Marseille. That's horrible. Might as well tell you about the bad ones, too. Uh, this one's probably a 6 out of 10. A 5 is a fig that I don't really want to eat. So this is just above that. Um, but this is the Black Madeira, guys, from UC Davis. We took my Black Madeira tree. It's such a long season, late ripening fig that I needed to bring it in the greenhouse. Even with the greenhouse head start it got, it's going to end up in the greenhouse just to finish. It's crazy how long this one takes. And um, so this one was nuts in how good it was. I couldn't believe it. It competed with some uh, black Madeiras that I've had from other parts of the country, like California. I mean, this was like, this just blew me out of the water. I couldn't believe how good it was. And I was able to get that quality here in November. Um, this here is a Smith. This is from earlier in the season. We just took a photo of it and uploaded it to this photo album here. Uh, by the way, this photo album that I'm looking at right now is available to you guys. Uh, I believe I did a video recently, this past weekend, I think, talking about some figs that are in this album. And I may have shared that album with you guys. If not, I'm going to share it now. I'll put it in the description of this video. With this fig here, it looks a lot like Black Madeira, doesn't it? It's pretty close. This is Noir de Barbantine. It actually tastes a lot like Black Madeira as well. Obviously not the same fig, not related, but um, this is a French fig, and I believe it's a strain of Borges Sot Noir. It's similar to, uh, you know, Brojoto Nero, Borda Sot Negra. They're all the same fig, depending on what country you come from. It's just different names for a flat black fig. It's really the same. It's the same name. And there's all different strains of this that have adapted to different climates. Maybe they've mutated. Um, they're all different in very slight ways. And some of them are a bit better and worse than others. And Noir de Barbantain, according to Bode in France, is one that has adapted better to moisture and it is a bit earlier than Borges Soap Noir. He says it's two weeks earlier and it just has better rain resistance. This fig was incredible, a 9 out of 10 for me, but not as good as Black Madeira. And you can see how black it is. I have a black grape there right above it that is just basically, uh, just to show you guys just how dark this this fig actually is. Um, so those are the figs I want to talk about. Those are the ones I just ripened pretty recently. Um, you know, but I also want to show you guys, I'm going to talk about tomatoes and melons. So I got these two books by the same author. Her name is Amy Goldman, and she used to work with, uh, maybe she still does, she works with the the uh, Seed Savers Exchange organization, and they save seeds and preserve varieties. Really, really cool, because I also am preserving varieties of figs with the help of two other growers in the United States. Um, so this is really cool to have someone like her. It's kind of, I would, in my mind... You know, I don't think she's probably the expert upon experts upon experts, right? Like in figs, one of the biggest experts we know of is Pons, and he has a whole book just like this of all these varieties that he grows, and he has such significant detail on the varieties in the book. She does the same thing with these two books, which is pretty cool because I would really like to learn more about different varieties of tomatoes, and I wish I kind of got these books a couple years ago. Um, I've already kind of narrowed down the tomatoes at this point, but I'm hoping for maybe a little bit more information in here to see if I can figure out and find some interesting tomatoes. You know, it's really nice photography in here as well that she takes the photos with. You know, if I was going to write a book, I really should get myself a photographer, even though this is, you know, the Noir de Barbatane photo you see here is a nice photo. These photographers, man, they're on a whole other level. Um, so... You know, I'm really excited to learn more about these tomatoes and also melons. And, um, you know, I'll put maybe the links to these books in the description as well if you're interested. But uh, I want to talk mainly about melons because the tomatoes, like I said, I've kind of got a handle on those. And I've discovered, you know, the many types of tomatoes, whether it's like, a, you know, a more Roma type or, a, you know, a beefsteak type or, a, a, you know, a grape tomato, obviously. Um and there's even more than that that she goes into detail here, which I'm interested to learn the differences. But melons, there's a ton of different types of melons. 
you can see here, I mean, look at this melon. I think they're a Charentes melons. I can't, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's a French type melon that she just has just unbelievable pictures and descriptions of these melons. And she talks about how to grow them, how to do this, how to do that. And the reason I'm so interested in melons, not only because they're beautiful and tasty, but mainly because they're tasty. When I went to Japan this past June, I had a melon that was incredible. It blew me away. I couldn't believe it was a melon. I didn't know melons could be that good. It's called an Andes melon that I had there. I don't know how expensive it is because we had it with a really expensive dinner and they gave it to us for dessert. We couldn't believe how good it was that we, we were staying there at this uh, Ryokin and they we basically asked for it again for breakfast because it was that good. Um, so I, I basically ate that melon and now I'm inspired to learn as much as I can about melons because their culture there in terms of fruits is totally different than ours. They strive for perfection, beauty, size, color, you know, also flavor, but, um, you know, their melon game is really on another level compared to us. It's a joke here. Our melons are disgusting. I cannot believe people even eat them compared to these melons that you can grow yourself or you can get in Japan. It's a joke. Um, in fact, some melons there, the minimum price for a melon we saw was like $7.50 for one melon. Most of them on average are about $10 and then you can get higher up which they like to do with all kinds of fruits is really sell these things at huge prices. Some melons have gone for hundreds of dollars for one melon. And I believe it because they're that good. Would I spend $100 on a melon? No. But uh, maybe to get the seeds, I would. Yeah, I probably would. Um, but anyway, um, I've been researching more and more on these melons and how the J Japanese are doing this to try to replicate that here. It's going to be impossible outdoors, but if I had a greenhouse and a stable greenhouse environment, I may be able to pull it off. Um, at the very least, I can get varieties here, maybe not Japanese varieties, but I can start saving seeds from these varieties that will then eventually adapt to my climate, become tastier melons, bigger melons, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and I can kind of get hopefully some pretty high quality fruit with the help of this book choosing the right varieties with the help of this book, learning about the different types of melons, and also, you know, experimenting and taking this very seriously because that melon changed my life. <laughs> and this is going to be my next thing, you know. Um, figs, you know, I'll always have a place for figs and I'll always be someone who's obsessed with them and loves them and will always grow them. Many varieties of figs I'll probably always have throughout my life. Um, you know, but uh, there's only so much new information out there. Uh, it's kind of dwindling now, you know. Um, I've already tried and sifted through so many, so many varieties that this is a whole new world, guys. And, um, you know, uh, figs is kind of, it's, it's, it's slowing down a little bit, um, is all I'm trying to say. So, for me, getting to the end of the road with figs. And this is going to be the new venture, at least in terms of how serious I take it, how much research and time I dedicate to this. Um, what I've been learning, though, is that there's like very little information on the Internet about melons and growing them, and growing them well to perfection. Not growing many melons, because the Japanese will grow one melon per vine. You know, I'm trying to reach just insane quality, okay? Same thing with the figs, right? If I can't reach a high quality of fig, it's not going to be enjoyable to me. It's not going to be as nice of a thing. Even in my humid and crappy climate, I can still get really high quality figs because of certain things that I'm able to to do. So, um, you know, that's it. That's the new venture, guys. Um, just wanted to let you know. Hopefully you enjoyed this one. Um, this was like probably episode six, I think, or episode five of Fruit Talk. At this point, if you're not watching, you're not sharing with this with your friends, um, shame on you. But anyway, guys, just to recap, you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. You know, we talked about some posts I made on Instagram. Same handle as my uh, my YouTube channel at Ross Ratty. Um, you can also get some things on Just Fruits and Exotics, and I will also have things for sale 
on FigVid right now. The Smith Fig Tree, the Dow Oso uh, tree as well, is ending this Sunday at 9 o'clock Eastern. So if you're interested in winning this auction, um, I suggest you guys bid. All right, so uh, take care, guys, and I hope to see you soon. See you at the next one.